things is that we need to understand that there's definitely different protocols that come with Indigenous knowledge, but that we can't really access some of the um, Indigenous knowledge without understanding the language and what that means. So we need to understand Indigenous worldviews, we need to understand the language, and part of that is by creating those relationships. Because tonight I told you about Teltan history, but you need to know about Mi'kmaq history and those creation sites that are here on this land and what those stories are, because that's what's important. And I always feel very uh, concerned about uh, speaking in other territories because I'm not from that territory. So my worldview really comes from a Teltan worldview. It doesn't come from a worldview that is um, that is uh, non-Indigenous. And I think those are really small. I don't know why they actually shrunk up a bit. But I really want to ask questions of people and uh, say, um, how, what is that synergy between our knowledge and working with our knowledge in libraries and archives and how can we make um, that Indigenous knowledge come to the forefront when we're in libraries, archives and museums and how can the difference between renaming things in subject headings and getting rid of the problematic subject headings that have existed like Indians of North America and how do we work within classification systems to indigenize that and then what knowledge comes from that and I find often when I work with indigenous communities that that practice of organizing their knowledge actually stimulates new knowledge. When I used to work with elders sitting around the table, um, my dad and other elders and then one would remember one thing and somebody else would remember something else and knowledge would start to come forward and that history would happen because sometimes people have different ways and we all know this, we remember history in a much different way. We'll look at the uh, uh, question that's before us today with um, uh, with Jody and um, our Prime Minister and how they remember their history. It's coming from different places and I um, I was very disappointed to see that happening in Canada because I have huge hopes for us as Canadians to make a difference and to change the world for future generations. So I often ask people to walk beside me on this road to reconciliation. I won't privilege Indigenous knowledge over your knowledge and I won't ask you to, um, and I ask you not to privilege your knowledge rather over mine, but to walk beside me on this path because it's the only way that we're going to create a better future for our children and our grandchildren and to create Canada in a new and better way. One of the things that I often talk about and go back to is uh, Vernon Kirkness and, and a few other authors talked about the four R's. And if we can remember those four R's because I, I ended up really um, rediscovering who I was as an Indigenous uh, person, as an adult, when I was 30 and started to go to the First Nations House of Learning and some of those things that, you know, you put away because you're busy raising children and, and um, working very hard and you're not practicing some of the things that we needed to practice because you get involved in school and other things. Um, but is remembering the, the four R's, which is the reverence for our, for our culture and our traditions, to respect it, and that it is reciprocal. And once I've taught you this knowledge, you're now responsible for the knowledge that I've given you tonight. And to remember that those are very important ways of, going, of knowing that we need to share with each other. We also need to remember that some knowledge is not going to be shared in um, uh, exactly the way that we might think that it should be shared because many protocols, and if we think about Indigenous protocols, they're really like our policies in the library. So when I moved to, um, uh, to Winnipeg, um, I didn't know that they didn't tell their stories unless the snow was on the ground. So, you know, being a gung ho librarian, I plan a storytelling event. When do I plan it? But for the end of March. And of course, the snow is melting. And the elder tells me the day before because she's teaching me a lesson because I didn't go and talk to her, right? Remember the relationship part. And she says, You know, we can't tell stories tomorrow at the storytelling event. I said, Why? She goes, There's no snow on the ground. 
I go, well, it might snow overnight. I went home, we fasted, I did the prayer all night, I don't know how much I even slept. In the morning, there was a thin dusting of snow on the ground, and it melted by the time the event was over, and I was so thankful, because I invited all these people, and, you know, I'm giving the elders honorariums and everything. Anyway, it was just quite the thing. But that, I always tell that example, because I think it's so important uh, for us to remember that when you're in a different territory, you need to ask. And I always said, when I was in my master's, people would say, um, well, you know, we don't know what to do because all these indigenous nations are different. I go, yeah, I kind of like Europe, and there's lots of different countries, but if you don't know what to call them, you need to ask them, ask them what they call themselves, uh, because that's the most important thing, and it also gives respect. So if your name is Sue, I'm not gonna call you Bob, right? We have to remember that. And I look at some of the descriptions that um, that they called my nation before they actually got it, that we were actually Teltan. And they called us the same as another nation in Northwest Territories. And it was like, okay, that's very interesting. And actually they called us the Stikinis too, and the Nahinis, and all these other things, because I think they just couldn't get the language. But instead of asking us, what do you call yourself? They decided to make up a name uh, for our people. So we had to obviously uh, change that back to Teltan. But this, that's the case with many people. And then people will say, oh, I can't pronounce it. I say to people, you know what? If you can say supercalifragilistic, you can say almost any indigenous name. I don't care what the name is, you're going to be able to learn it. Because if you repeat it over and over again, you can learn it. So um, I think that that's really important to remember. And I, I, one of the things that's so important for me is that um, I can remember sitting on um, on my sister's couch, and she was in law school then, her and her husband with Terry and um, uh, Williams, and she was uh, engaged to Robert Davidson, who's a quite famous Haida Carver. And he's, I was reading a book, I was reading his grandma's book, Florence Eden, um, uh, Eden Shaw Davidson's uh, book, and uh, he said, you know, do you know that that uh, anthropologist, because he knew I was an anthropologist, so he's challenging me, and he, he was very wise like that, I always found, and, um, and uh, still to this day, he's, he'll alternately tease and teach me but, uh, when, I see, when I see them. But he said to me, you know, Camille, we don't, they took our stories and they published them and then they own them underneath copyright. Well, I didn't really know anything about that. And coming from anthropology, I was like fascinated by the fact that he said he couldn't tell those stories without getting permission. And those are his stories, his family stories and his clan stories. And so it started something in me in, in um, the early 90s when I was in my first year to look at copyright. And I can remember being very disappointed in 2005 when it came down and we still weren't included. And I can remember going to the copyright meetings and trying to explain to people why it was so important. But I think that Elder Richard Abbey probably said it the best when he said, we don't ask for anything more than anybody else that our knowledge is cited that when you uh, quote us, or even because we're, we are a culture of morality, that when you cite us, even if we've taught you something, like our lectures in our classrooms, we cited professors. Why would you not cite the indigenous people? And then, how do you do that? Well, then they say, oh, well, we can't put it in the copyright because there's too many different nations. Well, you can put a general phrase in, and so that's what we actually talked about. I think I might have jumped ahead a little bit, but these are all actually in the granular recommendations of um, in within the Truth and Reconciliation Committee report, and uh, because of my passion for um, for the Copyright Act and trying to change it. I ended up getting to know Dr. Greg Yanin, who's at UBC Okanagan, who had presented to the UN, interviewing him and figuring it out and embedding um, uh, Teltan knowledge protocols into my own community. When I worked there, I worked with my sister and another lawyer from her law firm uh, to create our protocols, uh, what we're doing and what our policy is, what the access is, when you can access it, how you can access it, how you uh, talk about it, and I think it's really important for us uh, today in librarianship to remember that part of what we need to do is to create that relationship with communities. We need to do Indigenous knowledge protocols for things that are in our collection. Some of them may have um, uh, been taken 
uh, from the communities without appropriate access and without authorized, some that were unauthorized, because I don't know if many of you know, but Indigenous people only got the right to vote in Canada in 1960, uh, so four years before I was born, and my father didn't get to vote until, I think it was the next election in 19, say, after 1960. In BC, it was 1949 when they got the right to vote. Previous to that, there was things that we call the potlatch um, laws, but they were also the Sundance laws, and we weren't allowed to practice our traditions. And when that happened, many of the people living in close by communities or native shops or definitely the clergy um, took many of our um, tangible and intangible knowledge and stored them into library archives and cultural memory institutions. And they were taken really illegally to us, but legally underneath the act because of how um, they had banned that practice. And so many of them still reside in those places uh, that they are, and we were very fortunate that we have libraries, archives, and museums that held on to the collection, because some of that at Library and Archives Canada, where the wax cylinders are of, of our language, is some of the oldest recordings of Teltan language and many other languages. And so it's really about working with the communities to number one, provide them the right to access it, but also to, to say who gets the right to access it. And I like Marie Baptiste's quote from the University of Saskatchewan, where she says, um, in the quote bulletin, she says, we're not putting up with it anymore. You have to entrench Indigenous knowledge underneath the Copyright Act, um, because Indigenous people have the right to ownership of their own knowledge, and it is part of implementing under it. It's not really that people don't want to implement it, it's more about how to implement it. And so one of the things that we talked about was doing the Indigenous Knowledge Statement. And uh, this was put out last year, so the Copyright Committee, um, underneath the Chair Victoria Owen and Vice Chair Christina de, de Castell, um, and they worked with us in the uh, Indigenous Knowledge, um, uh, Indigenous Matters Committee, so that was myself and Anne Lundberg and Greg Yanning and uh, Kim Nayer was on both of the committees as well, and a few other people. And one of the things that we had said was that we need a broad overarching statement um, that comes about respecting, affirming, and recognizing Indigenous ownership of their own traditional and living respective knowledges. And the reason why that is, is because we want to encourage people at the local level to develop those relationships and those Indigenous knowledge protocols with the communities, because how we access knowledge in the Teltan Nation is going to be different than even our uh, some of our neighbors down south, or the Haida people, or the Kwakwaka'wakw people, and it's definitely going to be different than the Cree, and the Anishinaabe, and the Mohawk, and the Mi'kmaq. We need to know what their protocols are, what their access is, and different ways of accessing it. Some is women's knowledge. Some of it is clan knowledge. I come from Tuskegee clan. We have two clans. We have Tuskegee clan, which is crow. We have Chiona, which is wolf. And we're matrilineal uh, peoples. And I would say it's because you know who your mother is. Um, but and you do. Um, but you know, one of the things is, is that some of those are clan held knowledges. It might be family held knowledge. It might be nation held knowledge of our creation story. But you need to be able to work with the people who own that knowledge. And we don't know who it is. I don't know who it is in this in this uh, in this territory. But the Mi'kmaq know who owns that knowledge, and that's who you need to work with and develop those relationships with. So I think that that's really crucial. It was very hard to get that passed, and I was really happy to see that it did. And since then, many other people have talked about doing some of the same things that's been copied, and it's being talked about in legal circles, and tomorrow I, I was going to get to spend another two days in your beautiful country, but I've been called to a meeting in Toronto to discuss this with government and industry. And I think that it's very crucially important as we move forward to be able to make this happen in Canada so that we are implementing those sections of under, underneath it. And I will tell you that the people that stand that um, stand to lose the most are people who have never acknowledged Indigenous knowledge. And where you get the most kickback on it is things like um, pharmaceuticals and those kind of big companies. It's big business. That's why they're standing against it. And I was warned of that by 
um, uh, by one of the director generals in the government that that's where we were going to get the kickback, and, and she was right. So I think that it's very important for us to acknowledge that Indigenous people have the right to know, and part of that is um, allowing them access into our archives and into the Letter and Archives Canada. I can remember, in, I think it was 2014, speaking at an Archives Association conference, um, that this one of the archivists came up and she did. She was from one of the church archives, and she had denied one of the elders the right to their own records from residential school. That person passed away before they changed their policy. So sometimes we need to remember that our policies are not friendly or conducive to Indigenous people and to change those so that we're actually allowing them access to, often it's their own records that we need to allow that to happen. And I can remember her standing up and crying and, and it was so upsetting and I kept on saying, you know what, we'll forgive you, we just need to do better. The thing is, is it's not about resting in the past, it's about moving forward to the future and doing better. And like my elders say, our past, our history informs us. It informs our present of things that we need to change for the future. And it gives us direction to move into that future. So I encourage everyone here to be able to move forward into that future and to be part of the change. And I know they always say, well, be the change, be the change. Well, we really do have to be the change. I would say 10 years ago, I couldn't even hardly speak in public. And I was talking with Brian Moran the other day, and I said, do you remember that time when I went back to BC? And it was the first time I'd ever spoken at BCLA on a, on a panel that I organized for him, and I threw up into my napkin. I never <laughs> eat before I speak now. Because you can never, and this is for all of you students, if you, you would not do worse than throwing up in your napkin at the front. <laughs> I can guarantee. So no matter how scared you are, just go and do it, because it actually, I still spoke after I did, so. <laughs> because, you know, I was, all my professors were there, that's why I was sick in the first place, and I only drank coffee in the morning, and I threw up all the coffee, which was really gross, <laughs> for the lady coming up, so I just want to encourage you that even if you're scared, do it anyway, because we do have to be the change, and I often tell that story because it is about teaching people that even if we have done things that might not be um, perfect or maybe we've made a typo, but the fact is is that we're trying and we're moving forward. And I often get people asking me questions, many, many questions. And we were talking earlier today about creating a safe space where people can ask those questions. Some people have burning questions for Indigenous people that they're too scared to ask but they can't move forward unless they ask those questions. And so I always encourage people to um, ask me those questions that are particular to them. And I've tried to create that space. And yes, there's been many, many times where those questions have been unbelievably offensive to me. Um, and I've had to be able to get over that because if I don't share with you, then like the elders say, who will share that knowledge with the people? And I think it's really important to recognize that the Truth and Reconciliation Committee report was written to us as a profession. It wasn't written to communities. There was no consultation with communities because it was about changing us as a profession. And we need to create that change and to continue it and not to let things um, happen with, um, with uh, our Indigenous professionals. And part of that is also protecting our professionals. Because we have so few, we have 30, 35 now Indigenous uh, people in this profession. And we're tasked with a much different job. And I've talked about training and hiring and like um, uh, bringing Indigenous people into libraries and training them in our profession. And how do we, I used to say I was trying to make librarianship sexy for Indigenous people, and then I got old, so it wasn't really that anymore. But I think that one of the things is, is we need to get people from the communities to start coming into this profession, and how do we pull them into that? Because we have so few, and people are overburdened in this work. Um, we also have to remember that I've had people come up to me and say, well, if I hire an Indigenous person, then I'm going to lose my job. No, they do a whole different job than what you're going to do, and they're going to do things in a different way, and it's going to encourage, it's going to enhance your library services in a way 
that you will never ever imagine that having happened. I think it's really important for us in leadership also to, to be really involved in things like um, the murder and missing Indigenous women and girls because but for the grace of God I stand here today because I come from a place that's on the highway of tears. And I will tell you that I've had many close brushes in my life and I was really honored when Victoria Owen gave me this and I don't know, she's really good at talking to people, but she was able to get Peace Act to actually give us these for an Indigenous Knowledge Workshop that we were doing on protocol. So I was lucky enough to get the government pin, which I'm honored to wear, but I think it's really important that we bring awareness to that and um, that we support Indigenous communities in their nation building. And part of that is us uh, being able to fund things at the community level that brings people into uh, librarianship in a good way. I remember when I started my master's and my dad, who, was, who is educated, uh, he um, uh, said to me, Camille, why do you need a master's degree to check out books? And you know what? I couldn't have answered that 10 years before until I met Jane Joseph because I'd always volunteered in a library. So we don't, we have not been doing a good job. I think we've talked about this many times, how librarians don't promote ourselves, which we need to change. I don't know what kind of PR firm we need to hire, but we need to change that. And we need to promote it in Indigenous communities because when they see it, it's so closely aligned with our values as Indigenous people in preserving our knowledge and intergenerational transfer. And when they see us doing this work, it's like, oh, well, you know what? That's something I could do that. Or I could go in and be part of that because that's what I'm committed to anyway. So we need to pull them into our profession in a really meaningful way. And what does that mean for us when we bring them into uh, our schools, into our master schools? We need to have programs for them. We need to have classes that are specialized for Indigenous librarianship that not just Indigenous people um, take, but it's a cross-cultural training where you'll see that synergy happen between the Indigenous and non-Indigenous students. And that is really how we create that better future for Canada. So right now, we've had one meeting so far with the and a workshop on uh, Wikipedia for the National Indigenous Knowledge and Language Alliance. And, we actually called it that because we didn't want to call it a library or an archive or a museum because they weren't um, indigenous terms and that was our number 10 in creating that. So uh, the day before I finished this chair, we finally had our first meeting. <laughs> Maybe because I had to get one thing done in that, but uh, not really just because of that. We wanted to do it for many years. We just didn't have uh, the capacity to somehow make it happen. And, and I'm really happy that we were able to make that happen using Zoom. So all of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee report happened over teleconference, and all of the Indigenous matters were happens over Zoom. Many people, when I first went and talked about it, I never met many of the people um, that we were on the committee, but we chose to trust each other. And I asked everyone to leave their ambitions at the door, which I ask you as well too, because we don't have enough people working in this field and it has to be about the future and go with Indigenous librarianship and working with Indigenous communities. We have to be able to move forward as a nation and uh, we have to make our lives better for communities. And it's very hard for communities to think about doing this work when they don't have houses, when the people are homeless, when they don't have potable water, and when they don't have the money for education. So we have to figure out a way to deliver it to communities that's going to be meaningful, that we're not asking people to spend six years out of their community to do to become a library in our archivist. We have to figure out a better way. And so part of that is our discussions today, and I think we're going to be moving forward with um, an uh, Indigenous curriculum team to start we're looking at that across the country so that we can create standards that are better for our community with cultural competencies. Uh, indigenous librarianship is like basically the meter of mainstream librarianship. Whatever you choose to do, if you're a cataloger or a systems person, it's basically mirrored with the Indigenous community. So I used a few texts here and one of the ones that I like to point out is uh, the work that we did with the National Film Board in creating Indigenous cinema. 
and we revamped. Um, Brian Deere had been done about 10 times and he just passed and so I need to mention him because he was an amazing visionary who said, you're not organizing our information correctly, I'm going to create a system that does it, uh, that does it for us and it was really a records management system and uh, Jean Joseph adapted it to um, libraries and I think that um, his, his work and his place in our, our community has not actually been as recognized as it should have been because of his, he was such a visionary. But we must have adapted it about 10 times. It was very BC centric, so we created the Indigenous Materials Classification System where we went with the nations as the sun rises. And we also provided um, many different facets to be able to include things and, and revamp the names. And so uh, we put that in, entrenched it at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation alongside of Library of Congress and our ALMA system. They sit beside each other in those two different ways of organizing information. And then with Indigenous Cinema, we were able to, it was a digital collection, so we didn't have to have just one access point. We were able to have five and to be able to organize it so that they, you access it within uh, a meaningful way. Right now, with the Indigenous Matters um, uh, uh, Committee, we have a joint working group on um, subject headings and classification, which we'll move over to a wiki base um, underneath NICLA, but it was really, I brought people together that were actually recruited, quite a few people to be on that team, to be able to look at the problematic descriptions. <laughs> the first thing that we, chose to look at was Indigenous names for First Nations names. And I was never so honored as when uh, Cheryl, Dr. Cheryl Matoyer from the high school in the University of Washington, who's an incredible Indigenous uh, librarian and educator, uh, said to me, oh, you did exactly the right thing. That's what I would have done, Camille. And I was like so happy because I was having a little fangirl moment when I met her. <laughs> and, um, and of course, I am still mentored to this day by Dr. Jean Joseph. And um, believe me, I don't like getting the look. We always talk about the look in our communities because when you get the look, it's like, I remember when I was young, it's like, just think, we don't really have look. But because back in those days, people actually did spank their children. But, and so I think one of those things is that um, I, I, if I get the look from her, if I've done something wrong, I definitely know a woman and I'll be speaking with her later on this month, and every time I see her, she checks in uh, to see what I'm doing and if she approves of it and gives me unbelievably invaluable advice. And that's part of that intergenerational transfer of knowledge. Even though she's retired, I still answer to my elders and I will answer to them, um, to, you know, for what I say, for what I speak about and the work that I'm doing. And that's that responsibility for the knowledge that we've given. So I've given you all a little bit of a look into um, the work that we're doing. I could probably talk for days about it, but I want to thank you and say Madhu. So Madhu Cho is a huge thank you for listening to me tonight, and thank you for coming out on this nice warm evening compared to my day. <laughs> Um, but I'm happy to take a few questions if people have some questions.
that question really depends on the community and how it was um, uh, transmitted in the first place. So in our community, we still um, talk, we tell our stories around the fire. Uh, we um, have stories, that there's one story in particular um, that I can think of. And when I was a young girl, it meant something to me in a, in a certain way. When I became a young mother, it meant something else to me. And as I become older, it means something else to me again. So every time I hear it from the elders, it seems to meet me at a different place in my life. And we still tell those stories in our feast, around the campfire. Um, but I can remember when I was doing my undergrad because I was so thirsty for everything to out and I did the annotated bibliography of everything that had ever been published. So I had all this, um, you know, Western knowledge of my people. And of course I'd have the knowledge growing up. But I remember going back and saying to my, um, my uh, great uncle, and I said, uh, um, Uncle Pat, can you tell me um, that story? Because you know, I read, I read it, and I knew he knew it because he was the person that had shared it in the book. And he told me half the story, and he said, now come back next year, and I'll tell you the rest. So we still have our own access within our community, even if we are top down. And there's knowledge that I can't know that is, um, uh, wolf knowledge or whatever it is, we have to be really careful of that. There's knowledge that women cannot um, uh, cannot uh, hear or be part of if they're on their own time. And not because we're discriminatory to women, it's because we honor women and we recognize that they're more powerful at that time. So there's things that we don't talk about. There's stories that we do talk about, but only at that time that's women's knowledge that's specific for women. Um, and I think that part of that is the way that we go about it. If you see uh, the way the knowledge was transmitted through song, and I think I met um, a wonderful student, here she is, and uh, today who's doing um, a thesis about music and how it transfers that, and we still use that today, whether it's in our traditional songs, or if you see um, uh, um, hip hop, or you see it in other mediums, or I mean, we see it. In, we saw it in folk music back in the '60s that all told a story, and um, I think that those are some of the things that we're still, because knowledge is dynamic. It's going to become a new forms, right? But every nation has different protocols and how they're passing it on. I would say that there's no nation that I know of in Canada. Um, of over 500 nations that isn't actively passing on their knowledge. You might not see it outside of the nation because it happens in the community and it happens at our community events. Um, but if you become part of a community, and I always say to people, there's many different types of communities as well as there is in, in other um, uh, cities, but even um, there's communities around friendship centers for urban um, indigenous people that are in urban areas, and they have different protocols that they're passing on their knowledge. Uh, we see it all over, but it's still actively occurring. Some of the uh, reason why still those wax cylinders are incredibly important is because um, uh, my um, grandpa Robert used to say that basically the Teltan that people are speaking now is like baby Teltan compared to like a university level Teltan. And so some of the really people who were really fluent and could make up new words in the language have passed on. We have less than 25 fluent speakers that are completely fluent. We have many younger people now that are becoming more and more fluent.